Hi, welcome to Chemical Formulas Part 3. My name is Dr. English, and today we're going to be talking about using transition metals and polyatomic ions in chemical formulas. Specifically in this tutorial, we're going to be looking at what is a transition metal, identifying the polyatomics, a little bit of practice using the transition metals in chemical formulas, practice using the polyatomics, finding component ions, and finally wrapping it up with a little bit of practice with finding component ions. So writing formulas using transition metals. Transition metals are located in groups 3 through 12 on the periodic table. Remember that your transition metals are going to include elements like titanium and manganese and iron and cobalt and the real key things to remember about your transition metals is that many of them have multiple oxidation states, multiple charges that you can use in your chemical formulas. Some of them will, like copper, can be plus one or plus two, and other ones like zinc will only be one charge, like plus two. So just something to keep in mind as you use these with your chemical formulas. All of your polyatomics can be found on table E of your reference table. Now, remember, you must be able to recognize your polyatomic ions when you see them either alone or combined in a formula. And this is really, really key. So when you look at a formula and you say to yourself, gosh, I think that's a polyatomic, it is always in your best interest to go to table E and identify what polyatomic it is, what the charge is, how it's set up, the name of it ultimately. Table E is just a very good reference table to know how to use. One thing that I'd like to point out is just acetate. The acetate ion can be represented in one of two ways either as C2H3O2 minus one or CH3COO minus one. The C2H3O2 is more of an inorganic way of representing it, while CH3COO minus one is more of an organic way of representing it, which we'll talk more about later. Remember that a minus sign just by itself just means minus one, just in case you forgot. So let's start out by doing some examples and then you doing some practice with writing formulas using transition metals. So let's look at our first example here. We have CO plus three and F minus one. Now, like we talked about in the previous tutorial, all we're going to do is just take that number and we're just going to cross it down. Take it and cross it down to the opposite element. But remember the mantra, no positives, no negatives, and no ones, no ones. So when we do this, I'm going to write CO, which is my metal. I'm going to write that first. So I'd be crossing down a negative one, so I'm not going to include either of those there. And then I'm going to write the symbol for fluorine, which is F, and then put a subscripted three. And that three is coming from the cobalt, but again, no plus signs. Let's go over to this other example, Cu plus two, S minus two. Now the plus two and the minus two are going to cancel each other out. So we're just gonna write this as C-U-S. So now what I'd like you to do is stop, take a moment, try these four practice problems, come back and see how you've done. Welcome back, let's see how you've done. So for the first one, we have Zn plus two and P minus three. So again, we're gonna take the plus two and we're gonna cross it down to here. We're gonna take the minus three and we're gonna cross it over here. So when I write this out, it's going to be Zn 3, P, 2. Let's look at this next one. Cu plus 1, O minus 2. So the plus 1 is going to be subscripted by the oxygen. The minus 2 is going to be subscripted by the copper. So this is going to be Cu, 2, O. Then the next one at the bottom, Ni plus 3 and Cl minus 1. The plus 3 is going to be subscripted over here. The minus one is going to be subscripted down here. So again, we're gonna write the metal first, Ni. There's gonna be a negative one crossing down, so we're not gonna include anything there. And then the Cl, Cl with a subscripted three. Finally, the last one, Ag plus one, N minus three. So the plus one would go down to here. The minus three would go down over here. So when I rewrite this, this is going to be AG subscripted 3N. 
because again, we're not going to cross down the positive and negative signs. We're not going to cross down the ones. Now let's do some more practice with using the polyatomic ions. And again, it's always good to have your table E available to you when you're doing these, just in case you need to double check yourself. So let's start off again with two examples. I have the ammonium ion, NH4 plus 1, and the phosphate ion, PO4 minus 3. So just like we saw before, we're going to take this plus 1 and we're going to cross it down to here. We're going to take the minus 3 and we're going to cross it over here. This is an interesting situation because they're positive ions, which are typically metals. We're only going to have one element. We don't have very many positive polyatomics that are included in formulas. Ammonium is the exception to the rule. So when we cross this 3 down, we can't just put a 3, because then it would look like NH43, and frankly, that's somewhat ridiculous. So remember, you need to put a parenthesis around the NH4. So NH4, and then a big parenthesis, and then cross the 3 down. So that's basically saying that there's 3 ammonium ions, and then the plus 1 would cross down by the phosphate, so we're not even going to include that, and we're going to put PO4. Now, do you need to put the PO4 in parentheses? If you really want to, you can, but you, it's not really necessary. Let's look at our other example. Fe plus 3, SO4 minus 2. So the plus 3 is going to go to the outside of the SO4 minus 2, and the minus 2 is going to go down here. So when I do this, I'm going to write Fe, and then subscripted 2, and then in parentheses again, we're going to put SO4, our polyatomic, and then we're going to put 3 on the outside. Again, it is so important to have these parentheses here because if you didn't, it'd just be Fe2SO43, which again, somewhat silly. So make sure that you always put your polyatomics in parentheses if you're crossing anything but a 1. Now I want you to stop, take a moment, see if you can do these four practice problems, come back and check your work. Welcome back. Let's see how you did. So I have Cu plus 2, NO3 minus 1. So the plus 2 is going to go down here. The minus 1 is going to go down here. So my formula here would be Cu, parentheses, NO3, and parentheses, 2, subscripted 2. The 1 and the negative sign not coming down. Let's go over here. Sr plus 2, OH minus 1. So when I cross this down, it's going to be SR, not crossing any of that down, parentheses, OH, and parentheses, 2. And if there's one parentheses that's commonly missed, it's right here. I don't know what it is with hydroxide, but always make sure you're putting your hydroxide in parentheses if you're crossing with anything other than 1. Let's look at this next one. We have AL plus 3. And then we have our acetate ion, C2H3O2 minus 1. So when we write this out, we'll write out AL, and then parentheses, no need to cross down the 1 or the negative sign, C2H3O2, and parentheses, 3 subscripted. Finally, the last one, Li plus 1, CO minus 2. So the plus 1 is going to go down here. The minus 2 is going to go down here. So when I write this out, it's going to be the symbol for lithium, subscripted 2, and then the CO3. I don't need to put the CO3 in parentheses. You can if it makes you more comfortable. But really, because we're crossing down the positive sign in a 1, it's not really all that necessary. Now let's talk about finding component ions when you're given an ionic formula. So this is basically going backward. We have an ionic formula. What I do want to do now is break it back into its positive ion and its negative ion that you originally started with. This is a good exercise just to double check your work and really deepen your understanding of ionic compounds. So let's remember, ionic formulas basically have no net charge. In other words, they are neutral. First thing you should do when you approach a problem where you're trying to find the component ions is look to see if there's any polyatomic ions. Because if there's a polyatomic ion, you just write out the ion, you go to table E, you check that charge, because that's the charge it has to be. So like I just said right here, the polyatomic ions charge should be the same as what's written on table E. Now, make the subscript found in the formula the oxidation number or the superscript of the component metal 
and or non-metal. And you've just got to check yourself and make sure that when you're uncrisscrossing these, that they make sense. You don't want to take a subscript from a polyatomic and try to uncrisscross it and give an element a charge that's not even possible. So after you uncrisscross it and you assign the charge, always go to your reference table and double check your work. Finally, make sure that the metal ion is positive and the non-metal ion is negative. So let's take a moment and do a little bit of practice. Let's do A and B together as practice, as examples, and then you can do C, D, and E on your own and check your work. So MgCl2, my positive ion has gotta be the Mg because that's the metal, okay? And it's gotta be positive, some positive ion, so I'm gonna come back to that and Cl has to be my negative ion, and the only negative charge that Cl can have on your reference table is minus one. So basically it's saying a minus one came from here, so this two has to be coming from the Mg. So this is gonna be Mg plus two. Then you go to your reference table. The only charge that Mg can be is plus two. That's the only one that's listed. And if magnesium's positive, chlorine needs to be negative. So that works out because chlorine can be a negative one charge. LiBr, lithium is my metal. This is a group one metal, so it must be plus one. Br is a group 17 non-metal, and it is going to be minus one. And then I go and double check myself because these two need to cancel each other out because there's no subscripts here at all. All right, so now what I want you to do these are a little bit tougher, but I'm sure you can do it. Stop, take a moment, see how you do, then come back and check yourself. Welcome back. Let's see how you did. So here we have CuNO3 2. Well, the positive ion has to be Cu because that's my metal. Now, copper has a transition metal. It can either be plus one or plus two. So if I think about uncrisscrossing it, this two has to be coming from the Cu. So this is Cu plus two. The NO3 is a polyatomic. So I'm going to write NO3, and then I look up the charge on table E, and I find out it's minus one, which makes sense because there's an assumed one right here, and if I uncrisscross it, that has to be the negative ion. Ca, Cr2, O7. Ca is my metal, so that is my positive ion. It is a group two metal, so it has to have a charge of plus two. Cr2O7 is a polyatomic, so I'm going to write Cr2O7, and I look up the charge there, and that has to be minus 2, and that makes sense because if this is plus 2 and that is minus 2, they will cancel each other out, and we'll have CaCr2O7. Let's look at our final one, AlC2H3O23. So aluminum is my positive ion and the only charge that is listed for aluminum is plus three, so I'm gonna write that down. Or I can say, let's uncrisscross this, and it's coming from there, so it's gotta be plus three. And then finally, C2H3O2 is the acetate ion, and that is going to be minus one. So what did we learn in this tutorial? Well, we went to go over again what a transition metal was and where it's located. We looked at the polyatomic ions on table E. We did a little bit of practice with writing formulas with transition metals in them. We did some practice with the polyatomic ions. We talked about how to find a component ion, and then we did a little practice with the component ions at the end. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.